we're built for struggle, us human beings. You, you're not after um, the bubbles of bliss that Dostoevsky described in, in Notes from Underground. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge. And the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure. You want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world and you take the slings and arrows of fate and you make yourself stronger while you're doing so. And you might fail and fortune might do you in, but it's your best bet. And, you know, people have, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people. You know, you're doing fine in life and then you get cancer. And then six months later, you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend. And you develop by contending. And you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man. That's something to do. I'll tell you a little story. This is in my book. So I had this landlord in Montreal. He lived next door to me. He was an ex-Hells Angels biker. He'd spent a lot of time in prison. And his wife had borderline personality disorder, and she committed suicide when I lived there. My wife and I went over there, and we had a spaghetti dinner one night, and we sort of communicated, and I bought a poster from him because he made these wooden posters that had neon on them, and that's how he made a living. He kind of trained himself to be a bit of an electronics guy, and so he made these things, and he was trying to quit drinking, and we talked about that. He was a lot older than me. He was like 20 years older than me. I was about 25 at this point, and uh, we got along pretty well, but every now and then he'd go out and get and drink, and he could really drink, you know, like he was one of these guys who could drink like 60 beer. And you think, well, no one can drink that much. And you're wrong. I studied alcohol for like 10 years. Some of my subjects' fathers drank 40 ounces of vodka a day and had been doing it for 20 years. So you can drink a lot. And he could drink a lot. And what would happen? He was trying to not drink, but he'd go out and go on a binge. And then he'd be gone for like three days. And he'd drink up all his money. And then we'd hear him out in the backyard howling at the moon with this little little ugly dog he had, you know? <laughs> and he'd howl and the dog would howl and he'd howl and the dog would howl. And, and it was rather unsettling and made my wife nervous. But worse, you know, now and then he'd come to the door at like three in the morning, eh? And he'd knock on the door and he'd be standing there and he'd ask me if I would like to buy his toaster or his microwave because he needed some money to keep drinking. And, you know, I didn't really want to buy his toaster or his microwave, but when the ex-Hells Angel, Jewel-speaking, 60-beer-drunk Quebecois biker shows up at your door at 3 in the morning and offers you to sell, offers to sell you his microwave. <laughs> the easiest thing is to say, I really need a microwave. <laughs> so, you know, I bought the microwave and the toaster and <laughs> some other things. So one time he took me out on his 750 Honda and... He put me on the back of it. He wanted to show me his lair, I guess, his hangouts. And I got his wife's helmet on, but it didn't fit. It just sit on the top of my head. <laughs> and he said, I got on the bike and he said, if the cops chase us, we're not stopping. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then away we went. And we went to these, like, these bars downtown on Saint Laurent. They were very rough places. And he got into like four fights that night because he was a rough guy, you know, and these kind of punk, guys would come up to him and sort of challenge him and act stupidly around him. And he was very skeptical. And if you were acting stupidly around him for any length of time, he'd just hit you because he felt that that's what you deserved. And perhaps he was right. You know, so, so I had a first-hand opportunity to observe him. So anyways, he, sure enough, about a week or two after we had this conversation, he showed up at the door, knock, 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 you know, opened the door and he was standing there, you know, with his eyes kind of half closed and he was swaying. And he had, I don't remember what the appliance was this time, but he wanted to sell it to me. And I said, I'm not, Paul, I can't buy this. I'm not going to buy this because I know you're trying to quit drinking. And if I give you this money, then you're going to go and drink it up. And it's not going to be good for you. And what else did I tell him? I think I told him as well that this whole thing of him coming to my house at like two in the morning was scaring my wife, who he liked, and that it had to stop. And believe me, man, I was thinking about what I was saying. Because he was watching me like a rough guy watches you. And a rough guy watches you like this. He thinks, if you say one thing that indicates contempt, you're going to bloody well pay for it. And so I was finding my words like, you know, I was crossing a swamp and trying to look for the, 
for the rocks underneath the surface. And I said what I had to say very, very carefully. And he looked at me for about 15 seconds. And that's a long time to be looked at, at three in the morning. <laughs> and he left. And he never came back to sell me anything again. And we got along fine. But that's a good illustration of this issue with regards to truth and success in the strange land. Because I was in the strange land when I was talking to my neighbor, my landlord then. And I managed to say what was true carefully enough. So despite the fact that he was a very violent person. And that he was a very intoxicated person. And that he had every reason to be suspicious of me. And we couldn't communicate very well. And I didn't do what he wanted. That he took it. And he left. And there was no problem. And life went on just fine after that. And so, we don't want to underestimate the utility of establishing this bounded relationship with the ideal. And attempting to live with some nobility in truth while aiming at the highest ideal. There's nothing about that that's anything but strengthening and positive. And it's exactly what you need to set against the catastrophe and uncertainty of life. Treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. You're someone that you are responsible for helping. So what that means is you have to start from the presupposition that despite all your flaws and insufficiencies, that it's worth having you around and that it would be okay if things were better for you. So you need to take care of yourself like you're taking care of someone you care for. So there's a bit of a detachment in that. And then the next thing is, okay, so now look three to five years down the road. Okay, you get to have what you need and want, assuming you're being reasonable and that you actually want it, which means you're willing to make the sacrifices that would, that would make it possible. Well, you need a pathway to it. You know, if, you're, if it's 10 stories up above you, you need a staircase to get there, right? And so you have to build the staircase too. And so in the future authoring program, so you're asked, first of all, okay, here's, you get to have what you want and need. That's the proposition. But you have to aim at it. You have to define it and aim at it. So, here, so then the first thing is, okay, uh, if you could put your family together the way you wanted it to be, what would that look like? And so that might be your siblings and your parents, but that also might be, you know, your wife or your husband and your kids, assuming that you're at that point in your life. If you could have the family you wanted, what would that look like? Right, okay. Career, same thing. You get to have the career or the job that, that is within your grasp, necessary, and, and suitable for, for you if you were taking care of yourself. How are you going to educate yourself? Because you're not as smart as you should be. There's a lot more things you need to know. So you've got to keep learning and moving mm -hmm. forward. So you need to plan for that. How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? Right? So um, how are you going to avoid the, the, the catastrophic temptations, for example, of drugs and alcohol? Because that pulls a lot of people down. You need a plan for that. You're going to be a social drinker. How much are you going to drink? How much is too much? What about your drug use? Mm. You've got to regulate that so it isn't a pitfall. How are you going to use your time meaningful and productively outside of work? Because you need a plan for that. So you have, you, do, you want, do you want a long-term, stable, intimate relationship? And if you do, then how would you like that to lay itself out? You've got to have a vision for that because if you don't have a vision, you're not going to aim at it. And if you don't aim at it, then you won't even see the opportunities when they arise. That's the thing that's so cool. I wrote about this in chapter 10, which is be precise in your speech. It's a chapter about the fact that aims structure your perceptions. So, for example, once you aim at something, your brain, literally, the perceptual structures in your brain, in your visual cortex, reorient themselves to calculate a pathway to the aim. And then what they show you in the world is obstacles to that path and, mm -hmm. and open pathways to the path. That's actually how the world reveals itself. Just like, just like when you're driving in a car and you have a map and you, or you aim at a particular place, then all the things that right. are related to that place show up in the world. It's exactly the same thing because you are traveling through time and space, right? And you need a map. And so, so after you answer these seven questions and you're encouraged to do it badly because a bad plan is better than no plan gives you something to improve. Mm -hmm. So even if your aim is vague, and even if it's off target, if you start aiming and you see you're off target, then you can shift and you can make it more precise. If you go in the woods and you find a bear, especially a grizzly, well, you're in real trouble if it's a grizzly, but if it's a black bear, you know, generally speaking, if you stand your ground and make a hell of a lot of noise, that thing will leave you alone. But if you run, 
But what's it supposed to think? It eats things that run from it. So that's exactly where that idea came to come from. You turn tail and run, and then the thing that you're afraid of is really a monster, and it's going to, like, get you and eat you. It's like, well, that's true psychologically as well. So I have a client. She's afraid of elevators. The elevator door opens. She goes, that's a tomb. And I thought, oh, wow, I thought it was an elevator. But for you, it's not a bloody elevator. It's death. And so that's what you're afraid of. It's worse than that. You're afraid of being trapped inside there in the dark, alone. Alone, not knowing if anyone is going to rescue you. Stuck there with your damn imagination, freaking out. It's like, and if that's not... And then maybe you have a heart attack because you're so terrified and you die. So then you say, okay, well, you're afraid of the damn elevator, but it's not an elevator, it's a tomb. And the tomb is partly you and partly... It's partly the elevator and partly your unconscious mind. And so, well, what can you handle? Can you go and look at an elevator from 10 feet away? It's like, yes, okay. How about nine feet away? Yes. Five feet? Yes. Four feet? No. Okay, no problem. Four and a half feet. We're going to go from that elevator. We're going to look at the damn thing until you're bored of it. Because that's what we're trying to... You should be bored of the elevator. Because then you're not afraid of it, obviously. It's like, it's an elevator. So, this week they're four and a half feet from the elevator. Next week they're a foot from the elevator. And the week after that, the horrible gates of hell open and they look inside. And they don't run. And so, hey, they're tougher than they thought they were. And that's what you're teaching them, actually. You're not teaching them that the world isn't dangerous. Because that's a stupid thing to teach someone. Bloody right, the world is dangerous. It's terrifying. And sometimes people under, they realize that. And the veil lifts. And they see horror everywhere. They see that. And then they think, well, I'm just a little rabbit. I'm over here in the corner. I can't move. I'm, I'm petrified. And then they can't move. They hide at home. They cower at home. Because everything has become a predatory domain. And so what you teach them is, you're not as much of a rabbit as you think. So what you do first, if you're going to teach someone not to be afraid of a mouse, is teach them how not to be afraid. So you put them in a chair and you do a relaxation exercise with them. And then you show them a picture of a mouse. And you say, just breathe, you know, calm down. And so they all they calm down. And then sooner or later they can look at the pictures of mice by themselves. And then maybe you could throw a like stuffed mouse at them. And then maybe... You know, they could walk by a pet store and look at a mouse and so on and so forth until you get them like holding rats. And so, you know, that works, works. But it works even if you don't relax them. In fact, it works just as well. So the old behavioral idea that was counter conditioning was wrong, just like the idea that the reason you were afraid of a rat was because of conditioning. It's like, of course you're afraid of a rat. It's a rat. You know, it's just like you're afraid of snakes. You know, to a lesser or greater degree. And people actually become more afraid of snakes as they get older, interestingly enough, which is not what you'd really expect, right? Unless it was a biological function. So anyways, all you have to do is show people the thing they're afraid of. What do they learn? They don't learn that the thing isn't frightening. They learn that they're tough. 